I'm here with Uri Valchua, the music director designate of the Houston Symphony at the Pierre Boulez Hall of the Berlin State Opera, where we're about to sign his contract. Uri, it's great to be here with My you in, in Europe and great to be able to talk to you a little bit and, and share this incredible news with, with everyone in Houston and, and really everywhere. It's my pleasure to be here and to do this interview. I wanted to sort of start at the beginning and ask you a little bit about your own background, where you're from and, and, and how you found your way to music. How, how did, what was your path to becoming a, a conductor? I was born in Bratislava, uh, former Czechoslovakia, and uh, now it's a capital of Slovak Republic. It's just 60 kilometers north of Vienna. And uh, my first contact with music was my mother singing and we had also some recordings in, apart in, a, in our apartment and as a young boy I remember I was always fascinated by uh, groups, ensembles playing uh, live music on the street. I had to stop and listen to it and when I was eight or nine years old I started playing a cymbalom, quite a strange instrument. It looks like a table with strings in my country is a string instrument, but everywhere else is considered as a percussion. So I started playing this instrument. I, I played in a group with my friends and I wanted to study this instrument in conservatory, but my father didn't want me to be a musician. Um, be more precise, he didn't want me to be a cymbalom player because it's not too easy. It's also not so easy to, to, to find a job. So I took some private lessons and a few months later I was admitted in composition class in Bratislava. So I studied cymbalom and composition and as a composer uh, I had to take some conducting lessons and my teacher told me that I should do it more seriously. So I did and uh, my first appearance performance as a conductor was uh, when I conducted my septet, uh, which I wrote for my friends. And I discovered in that time that uh, when you have a small amount of time and some difficulties to put the music together, a conductor can help. Then I went to Russia to study conducting and composition and a little bit later in France. How did, you, how did you find your way to Russia? What was it that steered you? I mean, because there are many places you could have gone to, to study conducting, I would assume. Um, what was it that drew you to Russia? So there, there is one particular reason why, connected to the uh, United States. In 1994, I was a member of the um, choir of uh, Bratislava's conservatory, and we made a tour uh, in the uh, United States on the East Coast. And we had a um, few days off in New York and we decided to go to listen to this legendary orchestra, New York Philharmonic. And it was in 1994, February, I remember. And uh, conductor was for me in the time absolutely a known uh, person, musician. It was uh, Valery Gergiev. And I've seen in, in his biography that he studied in Leningrad with Ilya Musin. So I told to myself, if students from this school are in front of the New York Philharmonic, it must be a very good school. And one year later, I was in front of Ilya Musin in St. Petersburg, conducting Beethoven's Second Symphony. That's a wonderful story and, and you know, really with a wonderful influence to hear this concert with Gergiev and then decide on your, your path to, to St. Petersburg in this way. Um, let me ask you one thing about the cymbalom. So you described it as a table with strings. You strike the strings with hammers, yes, right? That's right? Yes. And so this is sort of a rare instrument, at least in, in America. You don't see this very often. Is this a more sort of prevalent instrument in, in Eastern Europe? Is it in folk music? What's the, the sort of basis of the instrument? It's more connected to folk music, but some contemporary composers as uh, Boulez, uh, Stravinsky, in, I mean, in composers of 20th century used it in their pieces. Uh, Kodai, Harianos, uh, uh, Dutieux, 
and uh, but in my country it's more connected to um, folklore music but also uh, what is interesting that also my choice of this instrument is connected to United States it goes uh, to my great grandfather who came to US to for work seeking for work and he spent some years in uh, Pittsburgh and he learned playing this instrument in Pittsburgh he was in a steel industry and we found my father found this instrument in his old house and I started playing his instrument so that's that's how I started making music and what is interesting that uh, right behind uh, Heinz Hall in Pittsburgh there is this commemorative plaque saying uh, talking about Pittsburgh agreement which means that this agreement was signed in 1918 and it was f um, as, a, as a foundation of first Czechoslovak Republic and I made my debut in Pittsburgh uh, uh, my debut in the US. As music director of the Houston Symphony will become part of a, a tradition of, of, of very distinguished conductors Leopold Stokowski Sir John Barbarali, Andre Previn, Christoph Eschenbach, Andres. What is it like for you to, to, to kind of join this group and, and, and what do you think of when you think of that tradition? You know, the tradition and uh, strong heritage on one hand and on the other innovation, um, artistic energy and creativity, I think this combination uh, this is something that fits perfectly to uh, what a modern symphonic orchestra should be. Of course, my main occupation will be the music, is the music. But education and uh, community effort is something also very important to me. Because doing this, we support the future of our listeners. And I feel really honored to be part of this list that I'm going to be part of this list and at the same time I feel responsibility to continue this legacy of these great masters. Is there anything kind of in your own background or your own experience of music where you know you're, you're a particular admirer of one of these conductors a Stokowski or a Barbarali or have they been in any way sort of influential on you as a musician? Influential, I wouldn't say, but uh, I listened to them quite a lot. I had a recording of Sixth Mahler Symphony of, um, with Barbiroli. And Stokowski, it was just a personage. It was incredible to, to uh, listen to his recordings and um, also his arrangements. Then you can see that also view on old music, Asian music, in that time was completely different than ours. So I'm not only interested in listening old conductors, but it, it's like uh, something that gives you an idea about how was it before, and it's kind of memory of that time. Your position as music director starts in 2022-23. Um, and this won't be the first time that you've been, of course, with the Houston Symphony in Jones Hall. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your history with the orchestra and the, the experiences you've had so far? We have to go back to 2011. That was the year of my first visit to Houston and uh, first collaboration with the orchestra. And I remember the program. It was a Szymanowski Concert Overture, Mozart Piano Concerto and um, Tchaikovsky's First Symphony. Then, uh, second time was a few years later, it was in uh, 2018, and the program was Nikolai of Concert Overture, Chopin Second Piano Concerto, and Richard Strauss also sprach Zarathustra. And I was impressed by orchestra's play playing, and uh, I already felt a connection artistically and personally to this orchestra. And I remember uh, there was on stage enormous bell playing in, uh, in this piece, in Also Sprach Zarathustra. And in the end, where there is this <coughs> highest point of, of the, the poem, culmination point, there is this, this bell playing. 
and I just stopped the rehearsal and I asked the musician to play a little bit less because it was such an uh, incredible sound that you couldn't hear anything from, from other musicians. And you know how big the orchestra is in that, in that part. And he just answered, I'll try. So during the rehearsal, during the um, break, I uh, came to see him and I, he just showed me the hammer he was playing with. And it was so heavy that it was impossible to, to control the impact. So when you do a gesture, you just go. So every evening I was enjoying uh, conducting this piece and waiting for this moment to, to hear this incredible sound. And the last time it was uh, last March. And we had to change, of course, uh, program. But I have to say that I liked the new program even more than the original one, because it was a Perkinson's um, Sinfonietta for strings, Copland's uh, Clarinet Concerto and Beethoven's Second Symphony. So uh, I remember I was welcomed so warmly and I had really feeling on stage um, a true pleasure to be on stage and a great joy to, to conduct this orchestra. And what was wonderful for those of us sitting in the audience, and I think those of us that got to hear the performance multiple times, was the kind of back and forth between you and the musicians. The way that each performance was different and, and you, know, you were responding to them and they were responding to you and you were really making music in, in the moment. And, and I'm wondering just your thoughts on kind of that relationship to the, to the orchestra and, and you know, what makes this happen. You know, it's always, a great pleasure to feel like this, when in few days you feel that musicians are with you and then in a moment you can influence in some, some way the sound, accent or dynamic or just doing like this and to indicate that something will happen and they will follow. So it's such a great, it's like a dialogue. So I'm on stage, I'm not doing any sound, but their reaction to what I'm doing was just really uh, immediate. And it was like a discussion. And, and uh, when you have this feeling, you just want to try new things. You, have, um, you trust the orchestra, you trust musicians, and you can just sometimes improvise. It really came across in the performances. I mean, the orchestra played beautifully, and even with the distancing, you know, you, you just kind of forgot about this. The ensemble and the, the, the music making was extraordinary. So, so I think we talked about the connection between you and the orchestra. What are the, the goals that you have in mind at the outset of this deepening of the relationship for where you'd like to take the Houston Symphony in the coming years? I think that artistic vision is also a reflection about what we do and why do we do it. And we are only musicians, but music inspires, music can change lives, and it's about emotions. And in this pandemic time, playing for people, bringing a little bit of light to their lives can help. I think that we should be very present for the community even more now than ever before. And I would like to create and imagine thrilling musical experiences, give a space to diversity, imaginative programming, learning, and we shouldn't be present only locally, but also nationally and internationally. And I would like to do some recordings not because there are not enough recordings, but because it creates a memory of an orchestra. Tell me a little bit about um, touring in particular. For, for you as a conductor mm. and as a music director, what did, what's the importance of touring and, and how does the orchestra benefit from, from going on a tour and what do the people at home experience as a result of the orchestra mm. having been on tour? When you are touring, you are completely emerged in music. You are traveling and doing concerts. Of course, we are not doing a sport, so it, it's not to be fast or whatever. 
but to be in a different place, to perform in front of different audience, something like, I would say, in Berlin, Berlin Philharmonic, Philharmonie, uh, or um, Concert House in Vienna, and to know the level of playing, general playing in that hall, I think that this pushes people, musicians, to do better than best. And when you come back, I think that you come back better orchestra, because you just have seen how it's possible to play on the highest level. And bringing this back, I think that in somehow the orchestra keeps uh, the, the eye on the level they achieved uh, abroad. And you also mentioned recordings. And you know, as you know, the Houston Symphony has, has recorded for many years with many conductors. Um, but also during the pandemic, we started live streaming all of our performances. And just in, in, in your thinking, what is, the, what is the, the direction that you'd like to see the orchestra go with the media? Continuing the recordings, continuing the live streaming? What, what, what are your thoughts? I think that um, it was very good for all orchestras to have this possibility to be somehow present uh, for um, an audience, present some in their homes or anywhere in the world. But I think that uh, live contact, sharing emotions with the live music, you cannot replace it. And on the other hand, I think that it's important to be present also with the medias for some concerts, for some projects, um, to show what uh, an orchestra is doing to everybody. So I think that there must be kind of a combination uh, of, of this and also recordings. Um, there is not any more difference between uh, recording and playing almost a concert because all concerts are recorded. But there is somehow a different state of mind when you are recording, when you have this particular concentration and it's not a live recording and the result must be as good as possible. As you look ahead to the 2022-23 season, what, what is your programmatic vision for this first season of your music directorship? What can audiences in Houston look forward to? I will not give any name, but it's going to be very simple. I will conduct and perform music that I like. There will be uh, programs with, um, dedicated to well-known masterpieces from romantic and classical periods. But I like very much, I feel very close to the repertoire from the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. Curiosity will be important part. I like conduct rarely uh, uh, performed work, works, rarely performed uh, masterpieces. And uh, as you might know, I like conducting opera. So opera and concert performances will be also present in my programming. Because I think that opera is something very important to an orchestra. It makes them uh, play more listening each other. It needs more flexibility and just take care about something else than just playing an instrument. So this is something that I think help, it helps a lot an orchestra. And um, every season I would like to conduct a great big um, oratorio, uh, choir, symphonic uh, repertoire piece, at least one. And um, I think that very important is also a co contemporary music, living composers. And it would be great to have a project for uh, living composers to write music, especially for a Houston Symphony. Tell me a little bit more about opera and the skills that that develops in the orchestra. What is it about opera? What's going on in opera where an orchestra has to play differently than they might in a symphonic piece or in a concerto? You talked about uh, the interaction in Beethoven's Second Symphony 
between me and the orchestra. There is uh, enormous improvisation somehow, sometimes. Flexibility when you have a singers on stage. Every evening is different, especially when you have a double cast. And with a one cast, it's every time different because a singer can feel every night differently. And this makes the orchestra playing with more flexibility, listening and to try to catch the idea of what is going on and react to words on stage, react as a one person is something that is absolutely necessary in this case. And you'll, you know, you'll get to know also our, our wonderful symphony chorus. We have a, a, a very good chorus in Houston and so I think they'll be excited to hear about this plan of doing a, 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 at least one major choral work each season. If you decide you want to do more than one, you can. <laughs> I will, uh, at least I said. So might be uh, much more. We will find very nice uh, music for them. And without making any commitments, are there particular composers or particular works that really resonate with you as a musician? As I told you, the end of 19th century, beginning of 20, and somehow also this part of Europe, I feel very close to, um, around Vienna, um, Male, Janáček, Bartók, and also um, Debussy, Ravel. Uh, I feel very close because I study in Paris. Russian music is also something that I like very much, Shostakovich, Prokofiev. So Shostakovich had a very big impact on me when I was uh, studying in, in, in Bratislava, and especially the first violin concerto. I remember that I was almost shaking after the performance. It was something extremely deep and extremely powerful. Now, I know you have ideas about how to engage the community and how to bring music to the, to the entire city. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on what you'd like to see happen in that regard in, in Houston? We, we musicians, we are always happy to perform in a full house, to see people coming to concerts. But the, Sometimes it's very important to step down from the podium, to break distance between stage and the audience, and just bring the music outside, perform for people with a little access to concerts, like uh, neighborhoods outside of downtown, hospitals. And the benefits are on both sides. Com community, uh, gets to know musicians and musicians get to interact with the community in a more personal way. For me it will be very important to dedicate some time to young people, to young musicians, because they are the future of music and if there is music there will be also an orchestra. And I think that things like side-by-side -side playing, it's very helpful for young musicians. Just sitting in the orchestra, observing, to be there during a rehearsal. Or for non-musicians, just be on stage to feel the energy during the rehearsal. And then just to talk, to explain, to interact with them is something that is very important. So, and, and, uh the, for the young musicians, what role do you see for the members of the orchestra in, in making the, the connection with the with the side by side concert? Like, how would that how would that work in your in your mind? I mean, it's already the fact that they are sitting close to professional musicians and um, observing how uh, the process of rehearsing is going on and sometimes maybe also playing, uh, I think that it gives to anybody, a young musician, a new experience that you cannot learn in a school. That's something that you can learn on stage and you, when you prepare this, when you are prepared 
for this before you pass the auditions, I think that you feel stronger and at the same time it prepares some, I mean, it, it, there is some kind of continuity in this. Um, when you prepare your own musicians almost, or young generation, to join a professional symphonic orchestra. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Houston. What are, what are you most excited about, about uh, you know, coming to the city, getting to know the city? What, what most excites you about, about the city of Houston? Um, I must be honest, I don't know too very well the city because when I'm in a, in a place where I have to conduct, I'm not doing too much uh, touristic activities. So for me, most exciting thing uh, when I'm in a city where I have to conduct is the time together with the orchestra and time spent on stage and perform for the audience. You'll join us for a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in May of 2022. Your first performance with the Houston Symphony as music director designate, also with the chorus. Tell me, what, what, what do you expect it will be like to perform this you know, sort of pillar of the repertoire with, with your new orchestra? You know, I think uh, that there is not a better piece. I cannot imagine better piece. Uh, to conduct for the first time in Houston as a music director designate than this symphony. And as everyone knows, uh, there is a choir and four solists in the last movement. And in one moment they are singing lyrics, Alle Menschen werden Brüder. All people become brothers. And we talk today quite a lot about very important thing, which is community. Is there a better example of of it than this sentence. And so I think it's symbolic work. This for me and for humanity, this score is a treasure. And it's always fascinating for me to open it, to study it again and to find in it new things, new details, new relationships. And I must say that I cannot wait to be in front of the orchestra in Houston to conduct this symphony, this masterpiece, and I can tell you that already today, now, I know that I will enjoy it tremendously. Yuri, thank you so much for spending the time talking with me today, and I just can't tell you how delighted and honored we are that you will be the next music director of the Houston Symphony. Thank you very much. Thank you.